So good evening, everyone. Welcome to the AI and data analytics speaker series here at N NYU, uh, the Fubon Center for Technology, Business and Innovation. I'm, uh, I'm Foster Provo, I'm a professor here, uh, and I'm the director of the AI and data analytics uh, initiative. Uh, I'm also a distinguished uh, scientist at the Real Estate Unicorn Compass. Yay, Compass. Um, so as you know, uh, my guest today is Sinan Aral, author of the book, uh, The Hype Machine, which was uh, released this week. Hi, Sinan. Hey, Foster, great to see you. Uh, Sinan's the uh, David Austin Professor of Management, Marketing, IT, and Data Science at MIT, uh, and director of the uh, MIT Initiative on the Digital Economy. Um, and before I go on, one, uh, one other introduction. Um, I'd like to uh, introduce um, Liz Chen, who's, uh, um, who's our uh, assistant director here at the NYU Stern Fubon Center. Um, you there, Liz? Hi, everyone. Good evening. Hey. Liz is going to be moderating the Q&A session toward the end of, the, of, our, of our time this evening. So, Liz, the participants with questions should just put them in the Zoom Q&A as we go along? That's correct. That's correct. They'll put them in, and at around 7.30, we'll probably start our Q&A session. Cool. All right. Um, okay. So, uh, move it, moving right along. Um, so I mentioned that, uh, you know, Sinan's a professor at, uh, at MIT, but I wanted to emphasize that uh, Sinan's not just an academic. He's also uh, an experienced practitioner. Um, as an entrepreneur, he was chief scientist at two startups, both of which had nice exits. Uh, he's also founder of the VC fund Manifest Capital. Um, so um, with respect to our content tonight, not only has he, is he one of the top researchers studying this, he's also you've been a top guy actually practicing it. Um, and um, and he's also my dear friend. Uh, once uh, once we can get together in person, uh, uh, maybe after a glass of wine, you can get me to tell some some stories about the French ladies at the at the market in Provence who couldn't seem to, to believe that there were these two Anglais uh, debating how exactly to cook the rabbit we were buying. For example, um, so many great stories, Foster. You know, uh, we could sign up for a three hour session. And uh, we could we could regale the audience with all of the fun things we've done over the years. We can't sure. tell them about scoring morphine in the outskirts of Marseille, though. <laughs> that story may be if we if we get to it tonight. I'm sure the audience would be interested in that one. All right, so um, professor, it looks like you wrote a book. <laughs> I actually have it here. Hype machine, and let me read the let me read the subtitle: How social media disrupts our elections, our economy, and our health. And how we uh, how we might must adapt. That's right. Yeah. No. I really I really appreciate you having me. And uh, you know I've been doing a bunch of press and radio and stuff this week, but this session uh, was particularly special for me uh, because for those of you who don't know in the audience, uh, I was a professor at NYU uh, for many years. In fact, six years uh, before returning back to my alma mater, MIT. Uh, in 2013. So uh, that's how Foster and I know each other as friends and colleagues at the Stern School. And another uh, sort of tidbit of information that Foster is uh, way too humble to tell you about is that he uh, is in the book in numerous places because he is such a pioneer uh, in a lot of this research himself. So anytime uh, in the book, obviously, and I'll describe uh, sort of why I wrote the book in a second, but uh, when I go deep technically, I can't avoid talking about Foster, his research, his, his work uh, out in the marketplace. And so uh, it's really just an honor to be interviewed by a friend and colleague, somebody I'm very close to, but somebody who, you know, he's not going to ask me the fluff questions because he knows all the hard questions to ask, which is really good. Uh, so I'm, I'm just really pleased and honored to be here. It really is uh, fantastic to be uh, in, the, in the Stern and the NYU community, uh, again, even if it is only virtually. And I'm actually beaming in from Brooklyn, so not that far away from you. Yeah, we had um, joked about I was just going to go over there and we had that at the right. very end, I could just like lean over and shake Sinan's hand. Exactly. That would, have been, that would have been a nice ending, I we think. We didn't do that. We'll do it next time. Next time. Okay. So, All right. 
Yeah. So, so, you know, the, so this book, I mean, you're holding it up and it feels strange to have a physical thing in the world now. Uh, but this book is 20 years of research. And let me just pause on that for a minute. It is literally 20 years of research and four years of writing. And it's cited in the, the Social Dilemma documentary, A Bunch, uh, which is very hot right now on Netflix. Um, but really what we've seen is we've had a, tech, a, a decade of techno dystopianism, I mean, sorry, of utopianism about social media, how it's gonna save the world and connect the world and provide life-saving information and give free speech and give people economic opportunities and so on, followed by a decade of techno dystopianism where Elon Musk is saying that AI is gonna destroy the world and you've got documentaries like The Social Dilemma, but you have the, the great hack before that and books by Roger McNamee, you know, like Zucked, great books uh, that point out all of the tremendous peril that awaits us with social media. And rightfully so, I'm very glad that they're doing that as a clarion call to wake people up to the dangers that we face. But this book, is really designed to go under the hood of social media and really describe over 20 years of research and you know 20 years of practicing it in the marketplace, how it works under the hood. And much more importantly, what can we do if we're actually gonna roll our sleeves up and do something about the social media morass that we find ourselves in? What is the peril we face? What's the promise we can achieve how do we achieve the promise and avoid the peril? What can we do? Cool. So um, I've read the book cover to cover, uh, but uh, many of our, uh, I'm sure, given that it's been out for a couple, two days now, that many of our uh, uh, audience have not. And so I thought maybe we could start. You've, you particularly chose to call the book The Hype Machine, right? Why this particular aspect of... Uh, these social media systems uh, that the book is uh, that the book is about. Why the hype machine? Well, so I'm sure we're going to get into the four levers, uh, which are the money, code, norms, and laws uh, that uh, determine the mess we're in, but also our keys to getting out of it. One of those four levers is the money, and the money refers to the business models of these platforms, and therefore the incentives that are created by the business models. And what this social media economy is, is an attention economy that essentially is driven by getting people's attention and then selling that attention as a precursor to persuasion to brands, international organizations, small and medium sized enterprises, influencers, and yes, Russian agents as well. Uh, anyone who is trying to use social media to make people aware of different ideas, to spread beliefs, and also to change behavior. And so in a business model that sells attention and trying to get attention, the key metric, uh, one of the key metrics, in fact, probably the key metric is engagement. People need to be engaged in order to have their attention, in order to sell their attention. Uh, and that engagement model makes the, uh, the social media industrial complex a hype machine because it's designed to hype us up and to get us engaged because that's what, uh, that's what uh, rings the cash register. That's what brings attention and that's what is sold uh, in this marketplace. So can I interpret that as being, it's a hype machine with, and it's, simultaneously a persuasion machine. Yes. In fact, that is the goal of selling attention as a precursor to persuasion. Uh, and a lot of the book focuses on this element of it, obviously, because, you know, there's a chapter called Scaling Mass Persuasion. And I go under the hood of exactly how it works all the way from neurological foundations, you know, the neurological pre precursors to behavior change all the way through the economics of it, and then all the way through the technology of the persuasion element of the hype machine. And that is really the core element, both for marketers and for election interference. So the two questions that I'm asked the most in my role as a business educator are, did Russia tip the 2016 presidential election? And will they tip the 2020 US presidential election? And secondly, 
how do I measure the ROI to my social media and digital marketing spend? And the interesting thing about those two questions is that the answers to them are the same. The same way that you would measure your ROI is the same way that you would measure how successful Russia is in its, endeavor, in, in its endeavors. And that is all about the persuasion of this hype machine, its ability to change behaviors. So I have a question for you. Did Russia influence the 2016 <laughs> election? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is a fantastic question uh, and one that I cover at length in the book, right? So uh, what we know about Russian interference in 2016 was that Russia sent and uh, uh, sent manipulative messages to about 126 million people on Facebook, 20 million people on Instagram, 10 million tweets to accounts with 6 million followers on Twitter, and 43 hours of YouTube content uh, ahead of the 2016 U.S. presidential election. And uh, the key questions to ask in knowing whether or not Russia tipped the 2016 presidential election was, was the uh, reach, scope, and targeting of those messages sufficient and precise enough to, if it changed behavior, to make a difference in the election? And secondly, did it change behavior on two points? One, voter turnout, and two, vote choice. And in the book, I go through all of the evidence that we have to date about those about those three questions, essentially. There's a lot of debate. I mean, Nate Silver says that if you were to rate the top 100 things that influenced the 2016 election, social media manipulation wouldn't even be in the top 100. But Kathleen Hall Jamison wrote an entire book laying out, called Cyber War, laying out how social media manipulation tipped the election for Donald Trump in 2016. There's a reason why there's a big debate, and that's because the scientific evidence is broad, vast, and uncertain, and I go through all of it. The problem today is that Russia is interfering in the election right now as we speak, and this year, uh, the election is possibly the most important election we've seen in a generation. It's happening during a global pandemic amidst, amidst civil unrest that came about due to justifiable social movements around police brutality, but that is resulting in violence in the streets. There are questions about in-person voting. There are questions about at-home and mail-in voting. And they're way more sophisticated, Russia is, this time around than in 2016. They're, rudging, they're nudging American citizens ra um, to spread misinformation rather than impersonating them to get around platform rules about inauthentic accounts. They've moved their servers to American soil to avoid domestic surveillance because uh, the law prevents our intelligence agencies from surveilling on US soil as easily. And they've infiltrated Iran's cyber war department perhaps to launch attacks that, that are made to look like they came from Tehran. So the efforts are elevated and what's gonna happen next is unclear. And in the book, I go through exactly how they would tip an election if they could and whether they did in 2016 and whether they might in 2020 with a really a scientific hat on. So the, uh, my recollection from the book was that the, um, the fact that, they, that, um, that these external actors, non extra national actors um, were trying at a very large scale to influence the election is not under serious debate from the scientific perspective. Correct. I mean, the, the intelligence community is unanimous about Russia interfering in 2016 and Russia interfering right now as I'm talking to you. They are unanimous on both points. That is not under- The question really comes speech. down to two things. Were people persuaded <laughs> by the persuasion machine, right? And if so, was it enough to actually change the outcome? That's right. So let's talk about people being persuaded because yeah. I could see, I mean, look, they didn't persuade me. 
<laughs> you know, uh, of course they didn't. I mean, I wouldn't be persuaded by this ridiculous stuff, these false you know, news and stuff like that. And I don't even know anybody who would be because, you know, everyone's too smart for that. So tell me a little. I mean, your book yeah. is uh, you sort of you masterfully, if I may, weave together a whole bunch of different sciences um, to sort of help explain this. And so maybe we start with neuroscience, right? Yeah. Can yeah, I, can me, I really yeah. claim that yeah. I would not have been, I wouldn't have been influenced? Yeah. So, so let me just make a comment about interference and then talk a little bit about more, more generally about the process of persuasion. So those three questions, okay, the, the reach, scope, and targeting uh, is one. Was it sufficient if it was persuasive? Second, is it persuasive on vote choice? Does it change people from voting for one candidate to making them vote for a different candidate? And third, can it affect voter turnout? So let me sort of like give you a, a teaser for what you might read in, in the book about those three questions. There is no question that the, that the reach and scope was broad and massive. And there's no question that Russian interference was targeted at swing states. All of that is clear in the data. The questions of persuasion on vote choice and voter turnout uh, are less clear, but there is some substantial evidence. What we know about uh, vote choice effects for persuasive messaging to change people's vote choices is that it's very, very difficult to persuade people to change their vote choices. And most large scale experiments find very small to zero effects on vote choice. Although, as I detail in the book, there are cases in which on issue specific elections and, and uh, in certain types of elections, there are statistically significant effects on vote choice. So that's voter choice. Voter turnout, however, the evidence indicates that there is a significant ability to influence voter turnout through persuasive social media messages. And in fact, we've seen very large scale experiments done by the social media platforms that prove that they can change voter turnout to a great extent. And we've seen, and I describe all those experiments in the book. So if you combine targeting with the reasonably good assumption that voter turnout can be affected, if the right people are targeted in the right states to affect voter turnout, there is a reasonably, uh, you know, there is a path where you could argue that it could have an effect without that much, um, you know, uh, uh, of a stretch. Now, in terms of persuasion, uh, it depends on what you're trying to persuade people about. So voting, there's a lot of uh, research on persuasion in voting. And then there's also a ton of uh, research on persuasion in marketing. So for instance, clicks or conversions are getting people to buy products, all of which is covered in the book. And in the book, I try to take you on this journey about persuasion that, as you say, starts with the neuroscience. So you know, the, the fourth chapter in the book is called Your Brain on Social Media. Uh, which is all about what happens inside our brains when we're using social media. Uh, and some really fascinating stories that I could have never imagined before I started researching the book. Uh, like, for instance, that our brains have evolved to process social signals. So human beings have uh, some of the largest brains relative to body weight on the planet, one of the largest among any species, and neocortex ratio, the ratio of the neocortex uh, relative to the rest of the brain is very large in humans compared to almost all other species. And one of the leading uh, hypotheses for why this is true is called the social brain hypothesis, which is that we evolve such big brains because we have such a complex social hierarchy and sociality. And in order to process these complex social signals, our brains grew large and our neocortex grew large. And so when you put it in that context, the invention of the hype machine and the meteoric rise of the hype machine is, uh, is, is in some sense predictable because it's like throwing a lit match into a pool of gasoline. We 
we evolved to process these social signals. Then we invented a technology that scales these social signals and delivers up to us social signals in the, forms of, in the form of likes, comments, shares, what my cousin ate for dinner last night, you know, what somebody else thinks about somebody else uh, in the trillions per day. Uh, and, and we are trained to process these social signals. So the chapter goes through that, the dopamine response that is created and how, as Sean Parker admitted in 2017, they built Facebook to give you a dopamine hit so that you would keep coming back for more of that social validation. Uh, and I also cover the neural precursors to behavior change, which are all about how persuasive messages uh, trigger the right parts of the brain that are related to our value systems, our response inhibitions, and, uh, and in fact, our reward systems that, that inspire us to change our behavior based on what we're seeing. The rest of the book talks about behavior change in the way I've studied it, which is much more around the economics and sociology of the technology and large scale experiments that we conducted on Facebook and WeChat and Twitter and LinkedIn, all of which are explained in the book. So um, I imagine we'll get to some of that, but um, another thing I wanted to sort of bring up early is you have, you use the term hyper socialization. It's actually in the title of two different chapters. Um, Maybe tell a little about what's this thing, hyper-socialization. Yeah. So hyper-socialization is the idea that, so James Surowiecki, and we're going to, I'm sure we're going to get to this, but James Surowiecki wrote this great book uh, called The Wisdom of Crowds. Some of you guys may have heard of it, read it. I read it. I loved it. I thought it was amazing. And he wrote this book in 2004. And the only problem with this book is that it was published in the same year that Mark Zuckerberg founded Facebook. And the problem is that the three pillars on which the wisdom of our crowds, the wisdom of our society are founded are independence, diversity, and equality. And social media erodes all three of those pillars. So take independence, which is what hyper-socialization is all about. Sir Wiki and Scheller, the economist uh, before him, uh, say that you know, the, the concept of crowd wisdom is intact because we mainly make decisions based on our own signals from the market. And so we're not really making decisions based on the signals of everybody else. And the problem with that is that Sir Wiki and Scheller in 2004 weren't yet introduced to shares, retweets, trending topics, notifications, Right? And so now the situation is that you could say the opposite is true. We no longer make any decisions without the opinions of our peers being part of that decision. And that's what hyper-socialization is. Hyper-socialization is the injection of our peers' opinions, beliefs, behaviors into our own perspectives, opinions, beliefs, and behaviors. And what that dramatic algorithmically driven interdependence does to our society from voting to shopping to dating to charitable giving all of which are covered in the book so so one you know sort of the back then like the notion of the wisdom of crowds was you know based on the examples i think it's in sir wiki's book you know about like the uh, guessing the weight of the ox and you know which if you don't uh if you're not familiar with this the idea would be at the county fair no individual could necessarily guess the weight of the ox but if you averaged everybody's vote you got a pretty accurate estimate of the of the weight of the ox i imagine these are all farmers <laughs> if you have right. our guesses i'm not sure you'd get a, a <laughs> <laughs> estimate. Right. Um, so um so in that sense it's you know the 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 idea was very much crowds are smarter than, into, than the average individual, not than maybe the smartest individual, right? Um, does this mean that with hyper-socialization, actually we are becoming less smart? <laughs> nice choice of words. Um, <laughs> so the answer to your question is, first of all, the, uh, the theory of the wisdom of crowds has evolved since uh, Galton, which was the, the guessing of the weight of the ox, to things like... Um, 
you know, uh, collaboration at scale, the abil innovation, the ability for a society to find the truth and for most of the members of that society to uh, believe in the truth, uh, assuming there is an objective truth and so on. Uh, so it, it, it evolved way beyond the guessing of, you know, jelly beans in a jar or the weight of an ox to much more important societal uh, consequences. And uh, the, the basic answer to your question is that the way that the hype machine is currently designed leads us to madness. So people who know Matt Jackson and Ben Golub, two incredibly smart economists, uh, Matt at Stanford, Ben now at Harvard, formerly Matt's uh, student at Stanford, uh, they did this amazing study on the wisdom of crowds and just looking at equality. So we talked about in interdependence versus independence. Diversity is the other one. Scott Page uh, at Michigan has done so much amazing work on uh, diversity. He's got a, a couple of books on it. And then this notion of equality. And they did, they did this amazing research and they found that the one thing, the one thing that prevents societies from achieving wisdom, from being wise, is influencers. Having people in society that have undue voice in the global conversation. And of course we've had undue voice for a long time, but I note in the book, all of the reasons why the hype machine accelerates that inequality, and studies have shown this over and over again, through the popular being suggested more often in friend suggestion algorithms, them being more able to make those connections in PYK algorithms, trending algorithms, taking that which seems to be uh, starting to trend and amplifying it, uh, algorithmic amplification on the news feed and so on. And if you read the research of, say, Christina Lehrman, you see that the top 1% on social media gets more attention than the entire rest of the 99% combined. And the one thing that will derail crowd wisdom is influencers in Jackson and Golub's uh, research. So your question is, can we recover it? And the answer is yes. So the most research on adaptive wisdom of crowds indicates that if it's designed properly, and if we put our weight on uh, influencers that are knowledgeable, then yes, in fact, a networked crowd that is run by the hype machine can actually do better that, than individual decision makers in a crowd, but that's not how the hype machine is currently designed. And so in the book, I talk about what do we do? How do we design this to achieve the wisdom that we've lost as a consequence of the design we now have? Well, before we get to that, <laughs> um, it seems to me like things are actually, from actually from your research, right, that things are much worse because it's not only that you know, we no longer have independence. We no longer have, div uh, well, maybe in our local spheres, we don't have as much diversity and we don't have e equality anymore, right? One of the, I think, most striking um, lessons from the book uh, is the relationship of how um, truthful versus not truthful information actually um, let's say propagates, and I'd like to sort of di di distinguish a little between propagates and gets propagated. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No. So just to touch on the first point you mentioned there. So you, we covered in independence and we, we talked a little bit about equality. What about diversity? Well, one of the major questions in society today is, does the hype machine create echo chambers and filter bubbles that tear our society apart and cause political and societal polarization. Well, when you dive into that research, you find that it is incredibly complex and there is a ton of data and information about it. And to armchair theorize about how social media is responsible for political polarization is a big miss, okay? Because there's a ton of communication scientists, political scientists, and amazing research that you need to understand before you can draw that conclusion. But Myself and others have done a lot of large scale experiments about whether the hype machine causes polarization or not. So I evaluate all that evidence about 
this notion of diversity as well. Does it put us into filter bubbles and echo chambers or doesn't it? So we'll put a pin in that and let the audience read about that in the book. But in terms of the spread of falsity, we did um, this research with Twitter, which we published on the cover of Science in March 2018. And we studied all of the true and false verified news stories that ever spread on Twitter from 2006 to 2017, 10 years of data. And what we found was that false news traveled farther, faster, deeper, and more broadly than the truth in every category of information that we studied. And it was particularly viral in political false news, which was the most viral category of information. And these were some of the scariest results that I've seen in my scientific uh, research. And in the book, I tie this to the Russian annexation of Crimea with new data uh, from that data set that hones in and looks just at Crimea, as well as elections and a lot of other stuff. So, um, and this was specifically had to do with news. Well, it was, it was uh, verified stories. It didn't have to be news. And we define news as any uh, article, be it from a news source or a blog or anything that had an affirmative, not an affirmative, but a claim in it. That was news. And then the subset that was verified was all of the news, any claim that was verified by six independent fact-checking organizations over 10 years. And that's a lot of verification. And those six organizations agreed on the labels of true and false 95 to 98% of the time. That was one of the most important parts of the study was how do you get a corpus of true and false that everyone can agree is a fairly solid corpus where your labels are accurate to have six independent international fact-checking organizations agree 95 to 98% of the time uh, was the foundation for that study. Cool. Um, and again, to me, this is, this is one of the, I mean, I remember it from the research, not just from the book, but, uh, you know, sort of one of the, it's just kind of mind boggling what the implications for this are. And by the way, let's go on a little garden path because, you know, this, this line of, 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 of um, investigation, you know, sort of caused, started me thinking about, uh, about social media um, and how, tell me, with the exception of news, that's why I wanted to differentiate news, yeah. because news, at least traditional news, um, has the characteristic that it's supposed to be true, right? So getting true versus false news Right. I mean, people might, you know, people might argue based upon what, you know, sort of political, uh, political um, persuasion and stuff like that. But it's supposed to be true, the traditional way of thinking of it. But on social media, news is only a minority fraction of what ends up, the content that ends up being posted and propagated on social media. So... What did it get me thinking? It got me thinking, wait a minute, isn't this a machine where everyone has essentially learned about, fa about the effectiveness of falsity, right? Uh, isn't that what social media is all about? Well, I mean, I think it is. How many, how many people take uh, 20 selfies and then pick out the one that actually really looks nice. Um, you know, my wife and I were uh, um, at a restaurant. We sort of at a, a sort of outskirts of Paris um, and sat down and there was a little narrow way in between us and then a big park and there was a skateboarder with a cameraman. And he's doing this trick where he went off the top of this thing and there was a big set of steps and he spun his skateboard in the air, you know, and then tried to land it. We had a long dinner sitting, looking out over the park. <laughs> he did it once out of a thousand and he posted and at that the, after, after dessert and sitting there <laughs> and he finally hit the trick. Did you clap for him? Were, were like, you oh, like, yeah. yes, you did it. it. He finally hit the trick and then they're like, all right. And the cameraman wrapped his stuff up yes. and he went off and, you know, on social media, it's going to be this dude can do this trick. Yes. Is this truth? Yes. I mean, I totally understand. 
And I, and I get your point. I think that's right. I mean, we are representing ourselves. And, I, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, I'll read you the quote that opens the hypersocialization chapter just because uh, it's so apropos to that. And it goes to some of the health effects, you know, like when our kids grow up you know, about, you know, trying to frame themselves in this unrealistic way and assume that they need to, uh, to live up to these unrealistic expectations. Here's the quote um, from uh, Jiddu Krishnamurthy, who uh, maybe some of your, um, you know, uh, audience will know is, a, is an incredible philosopher and sort of thinker. And he says, relationship between human beings is based on the image forming defensive mechanism. In our relationships, each of us builds an image of the other. And these two images have relationship, not the human beings themselves. And I think that that's extra true on social media. But in terms of, you know, the taking the selfie a thousand times and posting the one that works versus a claim, uh, and whether people have just become acclimated to understanding that yeah, you know, like Sinan doesn't actually look that good in his pictures. Uh, it's just he took a thousand pictures and posted one. Um, and, or, you know, the nailing of the trick on the skateboard or whatever. I think yes to that. But I think a very large fraction of people, including the guy that went to the pizza restaurant to stop the, you know, sex trafficking ring and started shooting at it, even though there was no basement in that pizza ring, do believe a lot of the news claims, meaning the claims that are made, not the selfies or the pictures that everybody knows is kind of like put in the best possible light, not the opinions, but even those things that are labeled facts and factual news, I think there's a tremendous amount of people that fall for things that are false and that are spread uh, much faster on social media than anywhere else but the, i mean let's get back uh, i'm not debating that the um but i guess part of sort of what i'm getting at is that sure right now we care a lot about election interference and we should um and in fact who knows what's going to happen in november with respect to that and with respect generally right um but you've got a kid i've got a kid right there is a you know, it's a, there's a mental health crisis right now uh, with respect to depression and anxiety among children. Um, is there research that ties this to the hype machine? Um, well, because I, it certainly seems, there's certainly sort of some kind of a temporal correlation, yes. that, you know, as the hype machine, this is my, this is my understanding from yeah. not being very thorough in researching it. Um, so, you know, what do we know about this? Yeah, so the answer is twofold. First, there's a ton of research, although it's nascent, and there'll be a ton more in the near future, about its effect on our brains, our concepts of loneliness, our uh, diminishing. So a perfect example is research I talk about in the book where uh, the randomly assigned, right, so causal, number of likes on images that depict risky or neutral behaviors that when you put a bunch of random likes on risky behaviors in the brains of our kids, it turns off or at least turns down response inhibition. When they see a lot of likes next to pictures of people doing drugs or drinking or doing uh, risky things, they are, uh, their, their inhibition centers in the brain are turned down just by the increased number of likes, which for me as a parent is a frightening thing. Now, there is research on sort of the mental health aspect of, um, of social media. I think there's a lot of research that indicates its negative uh, sort of potential consequences, but there's also some research that, uh, that indicates its positive potential consequences, which, which are include things like uh, connection at a distance, ability to have people there for you uh, when you might not be able to be physically present, the ability for shyer people to have connection when they might not be able to do that in physical uh, presence. So I think that the second major point besides kind of like the neuroscience evidence of what happens in your brain when you use social media is that there's a lot of evidence kind of going in both directions 
but clearly there's some evidence uh, around addiction and there's some evidence around uh, self-image and uh, things like that that are negative. And so I try to, you know, be balanced in general in the book without uh, taking the techno utopian or the techno dystopian view because the evidence doesn't support one or the other unequivocally. And therefore, I think we need to be a little bit more uh, deep about what does all the evidence actually say. So I try to present uh, different sides of each of these questions. Yeah. And I, I can see, by the way, the right now, um, my daughter's 18, and I can see how- I can't believe she's 18. That's just positive, sort of blowing my mind right now. The positive side of, um, you know, because everyone's locked, well, was locked in home, right. <laughs> locked in home, and still right. is, you know, sort of very much. And so the, the, the fact that they can make new friends and so on with, uh, while sitting in with their parents is, uh, you know, is a positive thing. Yeah. So I, I would be remiss in my duties if I did not turn the discussion a little bit to AI and data analytics, since this is the AI and data analytics um, uh, speaker series and a substantial amount of your book really is talking about AI and data analytics. So why don't you tell a little bit about what, how AI and data analytics, let's, let's start with plays a role in the problems that you yeah. uh, that you that you um yeah i mean clearly the whatever. algorithms are such a big part of the outcomes that we see in society and the way those algorithms are coded and the data that they use to make feed suggestions and friend suggestions and the way that they collect and use data is essential to the outcomes that we see i'll give you just a quick example so two of the most important algorithms in the hype machine are friend suggestion algorithms or PYMK people you might people you may know algorithms which are responsible for the lion's share of connections that are made on LinkedIn on Facebook and so on um, and the feed algorithms the news feed algorithms so in the book I describe exactly how both of these sets of algorithms work across the social economy uh, the people you may know or friend suggestion algorithms structure the network itself, who's connected to whom and how the network evolves. And that network is how information then flows throughout society and how the machine reasons about what you might like based on what your friends might like. The friends, the feed suggestion algorithms or the feed algorithms curate what you know by curating what you read. And so let's take the friend suggestion algorithm that structures the network itself. So what this does is it takes people that you might be, that it thinks you might be interested in and goes through and sorts and gives you a rank ordered set of people that you might be interested in connecting with. And the way it does that is its objective function is to maximize connections. So it wants to give you connections that you're likely to take because it thinks that that's a good suggestion because you've shown me that you like that suggestion. You took it, you connected with this person. But the engineering problem is complex because imagine you have 4 billion people out of which you need to look and search to see, well, who might Sinon be interested in connecting with out of 4 billion people? Well, engineers look at that and without thinking about, well, what would be good for Sinon or what would be good for society? They think, how can I cut through this very difficult engineering problem in a way that makes my algorithm more efficient and I can write my code very easily? And the answer to that is, well, instead of sifting through 4 billion people, why don't I just look at Sinon's friends of friends? That's gonna cut down my search dramatically and my algorithm is gonna hum through the data much more efficiently and I'm gonna be able to make these recommendations at scale. But when you do that, you're necessarily closing triangles and what wait, that means but wait this isn't just an efficiency hack that makes a lot of sense it makes a lot of isn't sense that where you're going to find people correct people know yes you're going to find people you may know but you're also going to find people uh who are just like you people who you have a ton of mutual friends with you're not going to get much diversity in your network and in fact uh it's going to go around quote unquote closing triangles mutual friend, open mutual friend triangles 
in the network at a much faster rate than you would find in society. And that's going to result in greater clustering within clusters in the network and greater distance between clusters in the network. And this is one of the aspects of uh, the polarization or the clustering apart of disparate parts of the network uh, in the hype machine. And so, yes, from an engineering perspective, and perhaps even from the objective of, can I get you connections that you're likely to make? And yes, the algorithm is called people you may know. And if I'm going to find people you may know, finding people you may know through mutual friends is a good bet. But it has unintended consequences, which are that the diversity of people you might meet serendipitously, people you may not have in common with others, as well as the polarization of the clusters in the network, uh, that the, the serendipity is turned down and the polarization is turned up by the choice of algorithm selection just in people you may know. The feed algorithms are similarly, uh, similarly have unintended consequences and they hunt through a ton of data in trying to uh, make these suggestions both for what you should read and, and for who you should friend. That's an example and there are many, many more I talk about targeting algorithms, I you know, uh, both in terms of politics, but in terms of ads. Uh, and I talk about many other types of, of algorithms. And so by the way, I mean, we, we, we've been talking about the persuasion machine as well as the hype, the hype machine. I mean, the, um, you know, you and I have talked about this a lot, but you know, the, when people think about AI systems, a lot of people who aren't sort of AI people, and even a lot of people who are AI people think about, oh, people, Game, you know, they're they're beating the the the, the champion at Go, and they can find you know sort of in, all, cats, but also other all sorts of more sophisticated things in you know in in images, and they can even do art, and they can complete your sentences on 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 Google, you know, and um, you know I've been studying artificial intelligence systems for thirty five years now. Those are all toys as compared to what is the most sophisticated AI system has ever graced this world, which is the persuasion machine, right? The system that actually has um, tens of thousands or probably hundreds of thousands of machine learned models that get updated continuously and they make 100 billion decisions every day worth easily over a billion dollars worth of worth of commerce, a, you know, a day. And the actual the intelligence systems just interact with each other with no human involvement and act in, in, in complex ways it is you know sort of utterly mind boggling this these you know these systems doing things that people you know, sort of could never do right my and my point is you're gonna fight that <laughs> oh. how are you yeah so 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 um what if this if basically we have what is the most advanced AI on the planet working towards the goals of the persuasion machine, right? What do we do? I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk, finish up our little AI section and then open things up more generally. So with the, you know, with our little yeah. AI section, what do we do about this? If in fact we actually have you know, some of the most, um, yeah, the most sophisticated AI working towards persuading and um, with the, yeah, with the not necessarily our best interest at heart with the goals of, in this case, mainly commercial goals. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, let me give you kind of a generic answer because I think that, you know, you and I could talk about this for five hours. I love listening to Jan LeCun talk about you know, what uh, is, you know, what he's built at Facebook and what Facebook has built in general. I mean, you know, it's exactly how you described. It is that sophisticated. Uh, it is that massive. Uh, it is that uh, sort of automated. Um, and it is that many in, an, in ensemble models of hundreds of thousands of, of continuously updated models and so on. It's, it's mind boggling, as you say. Um, let me give you some, sort of a 30,000 foot level answer. I think that the leaders of the new social age that succeed will be the ones that realize that aligning short term shareholder value with societal values in order to maximize long term profit 
are the ones that are going to succeed. And the reason for that is that uh, chasing the short-term engagement model and allowing the pollution of hate speech, violence, uh, phishing, false news, election uh, manipulation, and so on, is what creates the backlash that is the delete Facebook movement, the stop hate for profit movement, and so on. And so when you step out of the short-term engagement maximization, profit maximization view into the long-term, and you take uh, churn as well as kind of uh, backlash into account, I think that eventually the, uh, the, uh, you know, the aligning of long-term profit, profit maximizing, shareholder maximized, shareholder value maximizing perspectives and societal value maximizing perspectives is the path. I think that, and we'll talk about this, I'm sure. And, you know, look, the last chapter of the book, the longest chapter is about what do we do? And I don't talk in- My next question. Yeah, okay. I don't, I don't talk in generics there. I'm very specific. But I think that the first step in forcing the incentives to make that alignment is to lay out a, uh, a path to competition in the social media economy. I think that is the underlying foundation. On top of that foundation, I think we then deal with each of the market failures of privacy, fake news, election integrity, hate speech one by one. And there are a number of different things we can do in each of those. But the foundation is something we don't have right now, which is enough competition. So let's move on to that because uh, some of the, uh, the, the, the pre comments that I got were about how they, Facebook, et cetera, should just be broken up. And we hear this from Elizabeth Warren to, to here yeah. and the other place. And I, I, I understand that you don't think this is a solution at all. No, I don't. I, I, I'm, I don't have anything against breaking Facebook up. I just don't, I think that that's not a solution to any of our problems. First of all, it doesn't directly address any of the market failures. Breaking up Facebook does not address privacy, fake news, election integrity, or the rest head on. The argument for why it might is that breaking them up would uh, create competition and therefore an incentive for them to clean up the ecosystem themselves. But that's not true. And the reason that's not true is because the, uh, it, uh, the market, the social media industrial complex, the social media economy runs on network effects. And network effects tend toward monopolies. It tips, network effects tips uh, markets so that the rich get richer and towards uh, the large, you know, gives power to the largest players and makes them larger and more powerful. And so breaking up Facebook will just tip the next Facebook like company into monopoly status. Uh, and what we really need is structural reform of the social media economy itself. And that is uh, interoperability, data portability, social network portability, identity portability. We need to create a competitive landscape where these companies have to compete for customers by not locking them in to their walled gardens and giving customers the ability to vote with their feet and move easily, portably, for, and to own in a metaphorical sense, maybe not in a property rights sense, we can talk about the legal aspects of that, their social networks so that they can take from one provider to another. We did this in the cell phone market, right? It used to be that you couldn't take your number with you when you move from Verizon to Sprint. We legislated that. We legislated that the, uh, that the uh, providers had to make their switches available to competitors. And so I describe in the, there is legislation pending in front of Congress, like the Access Act, that would force interoperability for social networks greater than 100 million users. There are things we can do to create that competition. I, regardless of what you think about Facebook, I think that it, when it comes to competition, breaking up Facebook is like putting a Band-Aid on a tumor. It doesn't address the underlying problem of the structure of the market that is required in order to create that competition. Also, because of network effects, if you break up Facebook and tear that network apart without structural reform to the economy itself, 
you're going to destroy a lot of value that can't be reconnected through interoperability. That because that value is created through the network connections that are made, both locally and globally. So there's a double uh, risk to breaking up Facebook when you don't do the interoperability structural reform solutions in the marketplace. So I wonder what your what your vision is of what interoperability even looks like. Because I can understand when they made text messages interoperable, but they're just text messages. When they made phone calls, yeah, but they're all phone calls, right? But all the different social network systems do different things. Yeah. Right. And so if you're basically saying, oh yeah, we should allow Facebook to to take Snapchat messages, what does that even mean? Yeah. Like yeah. Facebook doesn't do Snapchat. Yeah. You know? Totally. So, so what does it I, even mean to have interoperability and be able 100%. to share your social yeah. network? Yeah, you know, I address this directly in the book. I spent I spent a lot of pages on it in particular, and I go through each of those questions that you're describing. And my my uh, sort of shoot from the hip answer to your question is, if they solved all the problems that they've solved up to this point, the complex engineering problems, they could solve a little bit of how do I make my messages that look different from your messages interoperable, even if it's just adopting standards across the, the most popular message types and each of them uh, sort of adopts a standard and delivers all those types of messages, whether they be, you know, stories or text-based messages or videos or, you know, and, and there's a lot of settings that can put the control in the hands of the user, like whether I want my story to disappear or not, or this one I do, but that one I don't. There are ways to wrapper the messages and so on. So there's a lot of technical ways to do the interoperability. And my sort of like tongue in cheek answer is really, you're telling me that they can solve all of these complex machine learning and AI problems, but they can't make a Snapchat message be delivered to Twitter? Yeah, I'm not buying that at all. Wait a minute. A Snapchat message is a picture and Twitter is a you, you can know, send you can send cards. you can send messages and videos over Twitter. Uh, and Snapchat messages can go to Twitter and Twitter it, it creates new technology to accept top Snapchat messages and tweets can go to Snapchat. They can create additional technology to accept those messages. I'm not buying the fact that this is too hard a problem for this industry to solve. Just not buying that. So um so Let's talk about now this final chapter of yours, because um, one of the differences that I see, for example, between um, uh, between your book and the um, for and for example, the Netflix uh, documentary, The Social Dilemma, but other things that I've seen at this is that you have, you know, what I see as a very solid set of recommendations and a, even a framework for what we should do about it, right? People can debate whether or not they agree with that or not, but you actually do lay it out. So why don't you lay it out for our, uh, yeah. for our audience here? Yeah, you know, I loved the social, document, uh, the social Dilemma documentary. I watched it actually last night and I, you know, I know a lot of the people in the movie and you know, oh, I think it's wasn't supposed to be a criticism of that. Just no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. no, no. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think that they, uh, what they're doing is really important. They're kind of raising the red flag, you know, drawing attention to the problems that we face in society. The thing that, that unfortunately it's tough in a documentary, unless you want it to be 12 hours long uh, to cover it all, is that I was, a, I was left a little bit wanting about the, what do we do? So what do we do? You know, uh, you, you've told me that this is a big problem. You've explained how big this problem is. It's a really big problem. The problem's really big. And then I'm wondering, like, what do we do? And so, you know, the point of my book is to kind of say, what do we do? And the last chapter is, you know, and throughout the book, it's about that. Um, you know, and the, uh, the um, uh, sort of point of the last chapter, but throughout the book is to answer this question. And uh, the, um, the basic framework is very simple, okay? So I begin with, a, with the concept that we need competition. And I kind of describe what I just described to you about whether we should break up Facebook or whether interoperability is a solution. What are the technical solutions for the actual interoperability? What are the legal solutions for creating that interoperability? Why is it important? And why would we destroy value if we break up Facebook without uh, structural reform to the economy that opens the chapter but then there are a number of market failures uh, each in its turn so I take 
privacy, fake news, election integrity, hate speech, uh, and the design of the, the health of the ecosystem itself into consideration one by one. And as you know, uh, you know, I've done a ton of research on each of those uh, topics, whether it's fake news or election integrity and, and everything in between. So rather than go through each one of those with my five minutes on each, which I have very ready on the, on the ready, uh, I'll just say that I don't, I provide very specific suggestions rather than kind of, you know, hand waving. And I'm willing to go to the mat and I want people to say, you know, let's have a conversation. It, are those the right suggestions? Because that's the conversation, that's the one conversation that we're not having. We're having the conversation about is social media tearing us apart? What we're not talking about is what do we do? And let's start that conversation. I recommend, you know, if you want the finer details, read the book and then let's, you know, take this to the streets. But, um, but I think that in the interest of time, I, do, I don't want to deprive the audience of the Q&A. So why don't we stop it there uh, and, and switch it up? Sure. Maybe that's uh, some of the, I, I right. haven't had a chance to look at the questions. Uh, Liz, maybe you could come and uh, uh, feed, uh, uh, send on some, uh, some questions. Wonderful. Um, we have a question from Craig, Professor Aral. Um, how does a user of social media filter out the hype and false news to get the truth and not be swayed without leaving social media? I mean, and uh, is, uh, yeah. And is LinkedIn immune to this? Can an individual user use data and analytics on social media to this end? Yeah, so Craig, great question, uh, really important. I actually just wrote an op-ed in the Boston Globe uh, about this very question, like what can we do? Uh, because, you know, to, to expect the platforms or the lawmakers to pass legislation and solve this problem in the next, you know, two months is a lot to ask. But what can we do? I'll give you a couple of very low-hanging fruit, okay? The first is um, that we should all be reflective, okay? When I see false news coming across my social media, it's usually, um, you know, preceded by the preamble, I don't know if this is true, but it's really interesting. If it is, we got to stop doing that. And the reason we got to stop doing that is because it's designed to be really interesting if it's true, but it's not. And that's the problem. So when you see something that seems really interesting, if it's true, then be reflective. Say, wait a minute, let me kind of like think about this for a minute. So the second thing we can do is Google it. So the 80-20 rule applies to false news in a low-hanging, what can citizens do today kind of way, which is that a few clicks can debunk a tremendous amount of the false news. Not all of it, uh, but a tremendous amount of it. Um, another really important thing that we can do is check our emotional pulse. So our research shows and the research of others show that False news, the reason it spreads so, so much farther, faster, deeper, and more broadly than the truth is because it's shocking, surprising, disgusting, anger-inducing. It boils your blood. So if you're reading something that boils your blood and you don't know whether it's true or false, you should step back and say, wait a minute. I know that this is how false news is designed is to get my blood boiling. Let me just stop, take a beat, and, and sort of like check it out. And finally, uh, pay attention to the source. And I don't mean the person who shared it with you, but the original source. Frequently, these are URLs that are masquerading as true news sites. But if you look at it carefully, it's like, you know, www.cnn.co.ml.int or whatever. Uh, or, you know, there's a lot of typos or words in all caps, you know, sure giveaways uh, of sources that are not credible. So those are a few things that kind of we can do. LinkedIn, is LinkedIn immune? I don't think any platform is necessarily immune. I think uh, there, are, there are ways that fake news can go on all of them. So Sinan, let me just follow up on that because what do you think is the responsibility of the platforms? It seems pretty clear to me that the algorithmic propagation of this stuff could be throttled. Um, yeah. Talking about problems that aren't really that hard. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so why is this in the arsenal of like um, either things that 
firms ought to do on their own or regulatory levers? Uh, you know, I think that, yes, the answer is yes. From a technical perspective, design of the algorithms and the sites themselves can throttle. So we know, for instance, that there's a ton of misinformation that spreads on encrypted messaging platforms like WhatsApp. Uh, and what WhatsApp did was it made a policy that you couldn't reshare something more than five hops in a, in a reshare uh, chain. And then they reduced that number to one hop. And that was in uh, an attempt to fight the spread of misinformation, specifically public health misinformation. And, you know, just to slow down all the information so the truth, uh, you know, has a chance to kind of catch up to the falsity. Uh, another thing is that, yes, we can, we can stop algorithmically amplifying and or reversing uh, the spread of the salacious false stuff, but there aren't enough incentives. Remember, the four levers we have are money, code, norms, and laws. In order to get changes to the code, you have to have changes in the incentives, which can come either through competition or regulation. I'm a fan of free markets. I am not a fan of unnecessary regulation. I think that there's a lot of regulation that is necessary in this particular case. And a lot of that is outlined in the book. Uh, but I think that structural reform of the economy combined with the appropriate legislation uh, can, and can create the incentives for the platforms to change uh, the code themselves. Uh, I don't think we should be in the business of telling platforms, like making laws about how platforms should write their algorithms. But I do think that uh, broadly providing sort of guardrails for the outcomes, uh, as well as um, creating competition, uh, inspiring self-regulation uh, through incentives are good avenues. Liz, let's go for another question. Okay, wonderful. You've answered a lot of the questions actually, actually through that answer. Um, I have a question from Ricardo. Uh, he's asking, did the wisdom of crowds ever exist Already in 2006, Nielsen posed Internet's 90-9-1 participation rule, and my own research on content creation shows that this is even more skewed. So influencers, both good and bad, have much more power, and we really have the wisdom of a few and not necessarily wise. So uh, I don't know that particular research or that Nielsen rule, so I can't really comment on it at all. Um, I don't have any evidence per se. I don't have a graph of wisdom uh, to show that it's increasing or decreasing or that the internet had this effect or the hype, you know, the hype machine has this effect. I don't have data, uh, reliable data on wisdom uh, over time to say when it was around and when it wasn't around. What I do have substantial data on is the relationship between the design that exists now and wisdom and the potential designs that have been shown in lab experiments that increase wisdom, that have clear analogies to designs that could be implemented in the platforms that generate more wisdom. So uh, rather than it being a question of, you know, have we ever had wisdom and are we really in a wisdom trough now compared to the past and so on, uh, if we are worried at all about polarization about people having different perceptions of reality based on which part of the network they sit in, uh, about having common ground, which as all students of negotiation know is the first step to successful negotiations. If we're worried about any of that, uh, then thinking about the design and its relationship to the wisdom of crowds in a metaphorical sense is important. And the, the basic takeaways are that one, the current design erodes wisdom and that there are designs, you know, the, the Wisdom of Crowds chapter ends with a section called uh, Long Live the Wisdom of Crowds, which is what are the experimental results that show us the path towards how we can regain wisdom through design? Uh, and that's really kind of the, the, the narrative arc of that part of the book. Wonderful. Um... I have a question from Richard. Uh, he says, hype machine through various social media outlets promotes populism. Some have been good as activists exposing any social inequality. Yet how do we protect ourselves from people with intent to pursue harms, lies, prejudice via the hype machine of social media? Whew. <laughs> 
I mean, yes. Yes, this is one of the key questions of our time. Uh, and, you know, the book is 300 pages, essentially designed to try and answer that question from scientific first principles. The populism point is, uh, is absolutely right, and I cover this in the book. So I do talk about, for instance, how important social media is, and Foster and I have debated for a long time, what is the role of social media and social movements you know, can we claim any real effect on social movements of social media? And I provide the evidence uh, in the book. I think it's quite convincing, actually, when you really distill it all. Um, obviously, social movements existed before social media, but social media is an accelerant and an enabler of social movements. But the only problem is, and those social movements can be really progressive and great, right? So the Snow Revolution in Russia, the Arab Spring, the Hong Kong uh, protests, Ukraine, Black Lives Matter, all examples. But social media enabled and accelerated social movements are also fragile. And the reason is they rise quickly without the time to create an organization and without the time to create meaningful uh, organized demands uh, that can achieve meaningful gains. Not always true, but these are the risks of social media enabled and accelerated social movements, all of that and the evidence for that, the causal experimental evidence for that uh, is discussed in the book. Thank you very much for that. Um, I have another question. Uh, AI has created tremendous value for shareholders by creating better products and commercial experiences for consumers. However, we are not only investors and buyers, we are also workers and citizens. And unfortunately, we've been inundated with stories and op-eds about job losses caused by and misinformation spread by AI. How could AI be used instead to improve our working and civic lives? Oh man, I mean, what a great question. Thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, there's no doubt that social media creates a tremendous amount of consumer surplus and value welfare in society. Uh, all of that evidence is detailed in the book, including studies at Stanford and MIT that shows that Facebook creates $370 billion in consumer surplus per year in the United States alone. But uh, you're right. It creates a lot of uh, displacement of labor through automation. Uh, and this is a section in economics called skill bias technical change. And the brightest minds on that question suggest that reskilling is the solution to that uh, problem of AI based automation uh, and substitution for labor. And in other words, that we need to think about progressive ways to make labor complement artificial intelligence and machine learning rather than substitute it. And one really good way to do that is to, uh, is to reskill or retrain uh, the workforce towards the skill bias technical change that has been happening, is happening, and will continue to happen. And to create uh, safety net measures that address those that can't be reskilled in the short term. Obviously, this is a generational question. You can reskill some workers for, of the next generation and for the next generation more easily than you can skill some workers that are at the end of their working lives, more or less, uh, and, and have much more difficulty reskilling for whom we're going to need safety nets and so on. Yeah, and um, I think at our next FUBON event, which is uh, the FinTech uh, conference next week, Liz, or the week after? Any case, coming up. September 25th, our innovation um, coming conference. Up, um, we will have a panel that have some, including some experts that are um, in the, the, the future of work with respect to yeah. AI and so on. I'm not sure it will be interesting to, to ask about the evidence on this. I mean, I know that, the, that AI is, is, is known to have created a ton of jobs and, the, um, and so the net, so there's two different questions here, right? right. Net. 
is it creating more jobs or is it uh, eliminating more jobs, right? And then there's a separate question of the displacement of particular individuals because right. of skills, right? Which even if you have a net grade increase in jobs, it's a right. tragedy if individuals are uh, displaced from their jobs. By the way, if you are interested in the, in the, in the human effect of the displacement of individuals by technology, uh, and you have not read The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck, forget about whatever you're doing this weekend and get The Grapes of Wrath and read it. Right it's, after you finish The Hype Machine. It's a, yes, uh, it's a terrible, ter beautifully terrible painting of exactly what happens with the displacement of, 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 of people from their jobs by, um, from their livelihoods, let's say, by technology. Anyway. More questions? We have a few more minutes. Wonderful. Um, I have a question from Sam for Professor Aral. How can our established news sources perceived as fake news by some regain their credibility and be the preferred news source over actual debunked sources? Whew. So, uh, you know, there are a lot of feedback mechanisms in the hype machine. Uh, the problem is that none of those feedback mechanisms are being applied to the quality of the information. So think about it this way. When you go and buy food to consume from the grocery store, it's extensively labeled. You know how many calories it has, how many trans fats it has. If it's produced in a facility that produces wheat or peanuts, if you have an allergy to those things, you know exactly what you're consuming. But when you consume information, online, you don't have anywhere near the same amount of background or provenance about the information that you're consuming uh, about, for instance, how often is this source putting out true information, fact check to be true? Uh, you know, what, what is the editorial policy of this source? How many people worked on this story? Where did the information come from? Who was interviewed or whatever? Uh, and in fact, all of the feedback mechanisms of the hype machine are currently designed around popularity rather than things like truthfulness or the level of education of a piece of content or the provenance and so on. Uh, crowdsourcing labels on truth and falsity and using machine learning to provide preliminary labels on truth and falsity using the crowdsourced labels as Foster and Panos Iparatis, who's also uh, formerly of Stern now, you know, on leave at Compass, has also pioneered research in that area, using the crowdsourced labels efficiently and effectively to train machine learning algorithms to then label at scale, not to take down or to stifle the speech of, but to give us more information about what we're consuming is a good way to start to get at creating feedback mechanisms that, uh, that direct us towards the societal values that we wanna see rather than the arbitrarily chosen for business model reasons, popularity label, the like button, which is the, the ubiquitous label that exists on everything today rather than all these other alternatives. And by the way, the, um, we do, in, in large scale technical systems, we do have systems that, um, that help us to eliminate false information, right? That's what reviews on Amazon help us do every single day. You know, early on people were, you know, could put out products that were fake products or fake claims about them or so on. The Amazon review systems have um, reduced that at least by an order of magnitude, if not many orders of orders of magnitude, right? We also have systems, I mean, Panos and I separately from the uh, work that, um, that Sinan just referenced worked, have worked on actually finding objectionable content on the web, right? And some of this has to do with crowdsourced stuff. Some of this has to do with machine learning systems classifying the content, but there's more than that, right? Uh, as Sinan shows in his book, the dynamics of the propagation of true and false stuff is different. That means you can look at actually the dynamics of the propagation of stuff and use that to infer whether or not it's true or false. Cool, right? Also, the individuals who propagate, 
are different. And so a way to actually find objectionable content online isn't just to look at the content, but look at who's consuming it. Um, and guess what? There are people who consume it. So there's all manner of data in there that could help us to yeah. be able to differentiate between different sorts of veracity of the content. And again, this goes back to, I think your points in on, on, on incentives. Is there any incentive for our, for our hype machines to actually do that? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that right now there isn't, uh, the right pressure isn't being put uh, to change those incentives, but it could be. Uh, and that's sort of the goal of the more structural solutions that are described in the book. Um, but, you know, right now we're just at the point where people are, are starting to realize, wow, we've got a real problem here. Right. So this documentary that came out this week uh, is an example of that. So we're at that stage, but we got to quickly get to the what do we do stage. And that involves those four levers. And that involves all of the ways that we can pull them uh, in concert to try and start steering this ship away from the rocks and towards calmer waters, so to speak. All right, Liz, is there one more question? We've got uh, we've got time for one more. Okay, um, I have one from Peter. Uh, he asks, do you think the hype machine will be rejected by the next generation, lose its market due to, due to the tendency to spread misinformation? Uh, do you want a one word answer to that? <laughs> <laughs> I think that the current generation, uh, there is no chance that the young generation is going to reject the hype machine, but they're much better at discerning truth and falsity uh, than the older generations are. And we see this in the data. Um, older generations are consuming fake news way more than younger generations. Older generations have a harder time discerning truth from falsity. Um, and so, but I don't think that they're going to turn off the hype machine anytime soon, primarily because it's designed to hook them, uh, but also because I think that they get a lot of stimulation a lot of, and some of, the, some of it positive uh, from it. And I think that, you know, what we really need to focus on, I don't, I, I, I don't think it's realistic um, to talk about in a, in, a, in a sort of serious way, the idea, I think it just hinders our progress to talk about uh, the idea of just turning it all off. That's not going to happen. Uh, so we need to get more serious about the more realistic things that we can do. Uh, it's not going to happen for a variety of reasons. Even if you want it to happen, it's not going to happen. And so uh, I think we need to get serious about the more realistic things that we really can do uh, to, to start to make real meaningful changes here. So let me ask you a deeper, uh, let me dig deeper in, into this a little bit, because this idea of the generations and their different ways of dealing with things seems to me to be really um, could be critical, right? So what do we do? We take this, you know, even for me, but especially for say my mother-in-law, right? You have a set of people who were, um, I mean, you know, I was in my forties when Facebook came out, <laughs> you, know, you, know? you have, you have a set of people who live pretty much their entire adult lives with traditional news sources, right? And so you develop a way of dealing with news and a set of expectations and so on. Now, now everything, the tables are turned on you. You know, can you, you know, can an old guy like me just turn on a dime and actually all of a sudden just completely re, you know, sort of treat news completely differently? Maybe, but maybe not. I think a lot of people can't, right? Whereas younger people, if they're actually brought up in this, right, will the effects of the hype machine be completely different from what we're seeing. And so in other words, does the research that we see so yeah. far really affected by the fact that it's largely done on a population who grew up without any hype machine? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that we need a series of efforts both to, I don't think we can just like put it all on the users or the citizens to say, you need to change how you deal with information. And that's the solution. I think we need a series of things that changes the system as well as, uh, and I talk about this a great deal 
uh, in the last chapter is about media literacy and thinking about media literacy for the hype machine age, the new social age, as I call it. What does that look like? There are a number of initiatives in different places and different pockets around um, educating people about critical thinking, about fake news, how to spot it, uh, and all of those kinds of ancillary things about how you interpret information in the context in which we get it today that's way different than the way that you grew up or that I grew up. Um, but those education, those media literacy programs, and by the way, the, the, the jury is still out on how well they work. The research is still being done. But I think there are some promising signs, although not conclusive signs about the role of media literacy and that kind of education. But that's mo mainly geared towards the younger generations, as you say. Uh, and so, um, you know, I think it's a combination of approaches, including that kind of literacy and education, but also changes to the system itself, which reduces the spread of falsity and or it's not just falsity, right? It's uh, questions about hate speech, it's questions about manipulation, it's questions about um, privacy, you know, just like the utilitarian and deontological concepts of privacy are front and center uh, of our, um, you know, policy thinking at the moment. We've got China, which is essentially a surveillance state. We've got Europe, which is on the far other end. And we've got the United States, you know, with the GDPR, which by the way, there are costs and benefits to the GDPR. And then we've got the the United States in the middle, which is a hodgepodge of 50 states, privacy laws led by California, and probably a movement towards, and maybe we'll see it, um, a federal privacy legislation. How should that be written? Well, I think we can learn a lot about uh, the costs and benefits of different aspects of the GDPR and use that to construct uh, an even more effective privacy legislation in the United States, um, given all the experience we've seen with GDPR uh, and with the Chinese experience. So time's up, unfortunately. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for spending the time. Uh, thank you, everybody on the on the line here for uh, for joining uh, thanks uh, thanks uh, Liz and uh, thanks IT guys uh, and um, any uh, any final words yeah you know um, for anybody who's interested in reading more I am putting up the link I don't know if I haven't been watching the chat but um, I'm putting up the link right now in the chat to all panelists and attendees um, I'm really hoping that this book starts a conversation uh, and so, you know, um, join me, you know, share this link with as many people as you can, um, read the book if you have time, uh, you know, reach out to me, you know, to put, put, put these ideas and your own ideas out there. We need to really, I, I want this book and the many other people who are uh, in this debate right now uh, to serve as a catalyst for a very important conversation. All right, well, I'll look forward to the conversation. Uh, I love the book, by the way. Thanks again for, um, for sending me an early copy. And uh, yeah, good night, everybody. Uh, see, you, uh, see you next time. Thanks, everyone.